Hi everyone, uh, my name is Rohit and uh, today I'll talk about SparkLens. This is an open source tool that uh, we have developed at Kubol and it's basically sort of uh, designed to answer two main questions. One is uh, given a Spark application, how many executors do you really need? So do you, can, if you add more executors, will your Spark job run faster or you're just wasting compute uh, and not really getting any value out of it? So uh, the agenda for the talk basically is that I'll talk about uh, performance tuning principles in general, some of them applicable to Spark, and then something uh, which are you know, very, very specific to Spark. And then uh, I'll talk, uh, spend a lot of time on theory behind SparkLens. It's most, mostly around uh, how scheduling works and what are the constraints that scheduling adds to uh, the scalability of the Spark applications. And then uh, I'll go through an example uh, where I'll show you how we can sort of use SparkLens and uh, identify what are the areas uh, where there could be problems and how we end up sort of solving them. All right, so uh, performance tuning principles. So mostly if you look at performance tuning, right, we, uh, there are very simple, simple things that we typically end up doing. One is, you know, make some part of your competition faster. So this is a very typical, right? We'll profile the application, find out the area where we are spending most of time, and then see if we can make it faster. Uh, you can, maybe you're using a order and scare algorithm. Maybe we can sort of use a order and log in, and that makes life easy. Uh, you can also do things like, you know, make, uh, you know, CPU faster. Use a, if you're on cloud, you can use a better instance type, which has more compute. Uh, most of these things will basically give you some level of, you know, make, if you make some part of the computation faster, obviously the total time uh, will reduce. The second sort of principle that is normally used is, you know, don't do what you don't need to do. Couple of things here, for example, if you're using Spark, and uh, let's say, you know, you're use, storing all your data in, in some sort of files, and uh, you had need to sort of scan them. Let's say you're doing uh, some computation uh, to find out what were my orders in last one year or something. And if your data is not partitioned, you'll end up scanning all the data. So instead of scanning all the data, if you could partition your table, you can specifically choose, you know, what, uh, you know, maybe for example, if it's day-wise or month-wise, uh, you reduce the amount of work that is required. Uh, and the same thing sort of applies even if you go deeper. Uh, let's say uh, you store your data in uh, CSV files and you have 100 columns. And typically your query only requires 10 columns. Now, 90 columns that you have read uh, for every record are complete waste. And if you can sort of use uh, file formats like Parquet or ORC, then we don't have to sort of read uh, these columns. And essentially we save some time, some computation. The third principle essentially is uh, don't do again what you have already done. And that basically refers to caching. And typically, you know, in, in, in SQL, it's a little hard to sort of, you know, do these things. But uh, when you write programs in Scala, it's pretty easy to, for example, put a for loop and forget to notice that, you know, there's some computation which is happening again and again. And uh, there might be advantage there. Just, you know, stop back, look at it, and see if you can cache it and reuse uh, it during the rest of the computation. The last part is use more resources, parallelize and distribute. And that is where Spark comes into picture. Uh, because that essentially Spark is a platform where you can put a code and it'll just get distributed over a set of executors, get executed and give you results. Now Sparks make it very, very easy to really parallelize and distribute. But depending upon how the data is partitioned, how, uh, what are the sort of constraints, how stages interact with each other, they all impact uh, the scalability of your application. So even though, Parallelism is easy, but ensuring that the work is actually distributed uh, is, is a difficult task. And that is uh, what I will be discussing uh, today. So let's just uh, sort of think about Spark uh, application. So Spark application basically has two parts, two distinct parts. One is uh, the work which is done in the driver, and the one is the work which is done in the executors. The difference between these two is that uh, in the driver, we are basically doing work uh, in alone. alone. By alone, I mean, you know, we're doing work which is... Uh, which is sort of restricted to the driver. And when driver is doing any work, uh, there's nothing which is happening on the executors. Executors are completely free. And once the, you know, the sort of the state of the execution reaches a point where it goes to the executors, then it's only executors which are working and driver is not doing anything. And uh, this sort of structure makes it very easy to sort of understand, you know, what's going on because, uh, so uh, one way to sort of think about it is, let, let's say uh, you were, uh, if, if you imagine, uh, you know, the basic hardware, and you were to ask a question, where is my program counter right now? Uh, that the, the answer to that question would be either it is in the in the in the in the driver, or it is sort of parallelly sort of executing somewhere on all the executors. So that is what I mean by you know uh, the the application being split into two parts. 
Now, uh, this structure, uh, so there are other constraints, for example, some stages should finish before other stages can begin. Uh, some tasks, all tasks of a stage should finish before the next stage can, uh, can work. And uh, all these things basically, uh, you know, uh, have, have a role to play in determining the scalability and performance uh, of your application. To really uh, tune your application, what you need to understand is its structure. So, uh, so, when, so when I said, you know, Spark is, is a profiler, I, I was sort of a little bit wrong. It's actually an inverse of a profiler. So typically when you profile an application, it, uh, profiler will tell you this is where the CPU is being used, uh, do something about it. Spark Lens sort of works in an inverse way. What it tells you is where something is not being done. So you have a resource, you're not doing anything with it. Uh, how can you do something to make, use this resource, this CPU, which, uh, which you have allocated, which you have purchased, uh, but you're not using that compute. So in some sense, it's a, so let's still sort of stick with the profiler. So one way to sort of, you know, improve the efficiency of any Spark application is to look at, you know, where are my executors not doing anything? And then uh, work backwards and say, how can I make them do something? And uh, if, you can, if, if you can basically make sure that all of your executors are doing some work all the time, you basically get a very efficient Spark application. So essentially, uh, you know, optimizing Spark is, is, is basically a manager kind of job. Just be a good manager. Uh, okay, so this is, uh, I, I believe, one of the most important slides. And I'll sort of keep referring to this like uh, over and over in the presentation. So doing nothing uh, is basically, you know, is what we are going to focus on as part of understanding how Spark Lens works or how even Spark works. So if you look at uh, the, the y-axis, we have driver and we have cores, core one, two, three, and four. And then on the x-axis, I have time. If you have looked at Spark UI, this is probably very, very familiar to you. Uh, but if not, then just, you know, take a look. And so these are the resources, and the green bars boxes that you see are the tasks which are scheduled on different uh, ex different cores. So for the purpose of this particular discussion, I'll, I'll not distinguish between cores and executors. So a four-core executor, a ten executors with four cores, or four executor with ten cores is same for the purpose of this this discussion. It has you know implications, but we can ignore it for now. And then. Uh, you, you can also see that you know there, there is a, there's a we, we sort of talk about stage one, stage two, stage three, and that is where you know these tasks are being scheduled. Now all the gray area that you see here is essentially you know uh, the compute time uh, which is getting wasted, and we'll sort of try to analyze it and see how can we split it up and understand uh, you know uh, where it you know what is going on here and what strategies can we use to minimize this gray area, and that is when you get a very excellent Spark uh, application or a fully tuned one. All right, so the first one is uh, driver-side computation. So as I said earlier, right, the structure of the Spark application is such that when a driver is running, uh, no stages are actually running. And uh, so all this orange area that you see here right now uh, is covered because driver is doing some work. Now, for example, let's say you have 100 executors running and your job, let's say, take 10 minutes. And for five minutes, there was some computation which has run on the driver. So literally, those five minutes will get multiplied by all the executors, that is 100 of them, and 500 minutes out of your 1,000 compute minutes are just getting wasted because there is no work for these uh, executors to really do. So first sort of principle here is, you know, if you can minimize your driver-side computation, uh, things will become much, much faster. And uh, so what do we do in the driver? Uh, one of the things that we do in the driver is file listings. So especially if you're uh, looking at large uh, tables, which for typically, you know, partitioned by date, uh, you will see that, you know, we have seen at least, you know, thousands or ten thousands or even hundred thousand files uh, being listed uh, in, in, in S3. And this is not too much of a problem if you're using Hadoop uh, because the name node uh, operations are pretty fast. But if you're working on S3, the listing could take lot, uh, a lot of time. And at Kubol, we have invested heavily in, in figuring out how to make file listing better for S3. The second, uh, you know, reason where I've seen, you know, we spend a lot of time in driver is loading of hive tables. So if you're writing from, uh, to hive tables from Spark, uh, Spark tend to write to a, a temporary directory, and then once the computation is, the whole computation is over, it will copy the files from uh, this temporary location to the final location uh, where the table is situated. Now, the problem is that usually when you work on Hadoop, uh, this this movement happens using uh, calling a, a file system API called rename. Now, rename uh, on Hadoop or HDFS is a metadata operation, but uh, rename when done on S3 
is actually uh, is a physical operation. It basically uh, copies the file over to a new location and deletes the original file. So in instead of being a constant sort of time operation, which is a method of operation just updating a, mem a memory somewhere, it becomes an operation which depends on the size of the data. So uh, we have done some work at Kubol in basically ensuring that you know uh, we can do. Uh, writes in a parallel way, uh, do these copies in a, using multiple threads so that you know, some latency is hidden. We have also invested in, uh, can we do these writes directly to the, to the table instead of sort of going through all this uh, you know, uh, temporary location stuff and ensure that in case of failures, the things are cleaned up properly. The third uh, place where I've seen it is uh, many people sort of use this innocently. They'll do a data frame, then collect it, and start for each loop. Uh, this essentially what it does is that you get all the data from all the executors into the driver. So usually you will sort of fail out of, we'll see out of memory happening here. But in case you don't, uh, this is something which is essentially going to cause all the computation to come and happen on the driver and uh, leave uh, everything sort of, you know, executors totally free. Uh, to, the, to the extent that I have seen some people actually calling a REST API uh, from on the driver itself. Basically for each record they'll call a REST API and update some external system. Uh, one more way where I have seen, you know, people uh, typically in, in, when you're using PY Spark is they will uh, convert the data frame to two pandas. Now, uh, naturally, a, a Spark data frame is a distributed abstraction, but the moment you convert it to pandas, you basically get a data frame which is running only on the driver. And this again uh, leads to computation which is only happening on the driver and you're not using uh, resources available to you. The second reason, you know, why uh, we see this... Uh, this uh, we see, you know, wastage of computers uh, not having enough tasks. So if you look at stage two and look at core four, uh, it doesn't have any work. So if you have, you know, four cores available and you're only giving it three tasks, one of the core is uh, not going to get any work. And if you look at stage three, similarly, we have uh, a core one and four, there are no tasks. So if you don't have tasks, there is no way, you know, that compute can be used. So be very, very sort of, you know, uh, sensitive to the fact that there are enough tasks uh, available for Spark to really execute. Otherwise, that compute is not going to work for you. So how do we control the number of tasks? Multiple things here. So, example, uh, if you're running on HDFS, right? HDFS block size is one parameter. The smaller the blocks, the, the more the number of tasks. But uh, similarly, you know, on S3, you can use uh, min and max split size, which sort of uh, defines the granularity of each task. Uh, then uh, Spark default parallelism is another parameter, which typically it's a property essentially. And at runtime, if if your code refers to it, you will basically get the current number of cores that are available uh, to the Spark application. Now this property sort of varies during the duration of the application. So sometimes it's it's, it's uh, if you're if you're whatever you're doing right, it. Uh, requires you to know uh, to set this to high value, uh, sort of set it to high value. Uh, fourth parameter that, that, that is very, very sensitive uh, to, to task is the Spark SQL shuffle partitions. Anytime uh, you do a shuffle, you will basically end up, uh, you know, uh, using this parameter and the default value is 200. So if there are more cores, you know, using a, you know, lot more cores than 200, you might want to sort of revisit it and see can you, should you basically go and increase it and uh, to a point where it sort of matches at least the number of cores you have given to your application. And the last one is repartition. That's a function available on data frame. And you can basically convert uh, any data frame into number of partitions that you need. Again, uh, uh, if, if, if the, if you're changing sort of, you know, maybe you developed an application when you were doing something on a staging cluster and you picked up a right value, that value when you run it on a, on a, on a larger cluster, this might sort of bite you uh, later on. So sort of understand the context in which your application is running and sort of tune it for it. The third reason uh, why we see, you know, wastage on the executor side is, uh, is skew. Uh, skew basically means that some tasks are taking a lot longer than some other tasks. So if you look at stage one, uh, this, the core one has a task which takes, let's say, two units of time, whereas core two, three, and four uh, work for only one unit. Now the way Spark is structured is that until a stage finishes, uh, the child uh, uh, parent stage finishes, the child stage will not sort of get scheduled. So it is not the average time that a stage uh, a, a task takes in a stage which is important. It is the worst case time that is impacting uh, the total runtime of your application. So uh, if you can reduce skew, uh, you will get something which is even better. So now uh, coming to skew itself, you know, skew basically happens exist in the data and it basically happens because some keys or some partitions have a lot more data. So for example, let's say you're doing, a, you know, let's say you have some sales data and 
you're trying to figure out the sales by city, and obviously, you know, the sales in maybe uh, Delhi or Bangalore are going to be a lot more than, say, in Kanyakumari. Uh, but what it means is that uh, as you get, as you, as your data gets polarized and there is a lot more data happening in 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 one partition, uh, it is the runtime of this particular uh, executor who is processing records for this particular partition, which is going to determine how much time your application is going to take. So handling this queue uh, becomes very very important. So for example, you know one way to handle this could could be that instead of doing uh, a join on 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 city, you might end up doing a join on a pin code, uh, which is far more sort of uniform. And once you have data at at at, at a pin code level, then you can do a second level join, which aggregates data for, uh, for let's say, uh, city level. So there are some sort of uh, ways to deal with the skew, but, uh, and it will depend on the nature of the data that you're working with. All right. So uh, that sort of uh, brings me to the notion of uh, critical path. So uh, if you look at follow the arrows, right, uh, this is uh, defining the critical path. So the definition basically is uh, all the time that is spent in the driver plus the time which is spent uh, on each uh, of on the largest task in each of the stages now this is sort of a little bit wrong in the sense that some stages can run in parallel so actual computation uh, requires that you you look into uh, the the max between the parallel stages but generally you know the the idea is same so what is critical path so critical path basically tells you that uh, you know this is the least amount of time or at, uh, which your application will take uh, to finish, and that is irrespective of uh, the number of executors. So even if you give infinite executors to any application, there is no way that that application will, will finish in less than critical time. The good part is that this, uh, you can, if you get a single run of an application, it's possible to compute this number. And once you know this number, you know if you're close to this number, you essentially need to go back and work on your application. If you are sort of farther away from this number, you still have scope, you can add more executors and still see some improvement. But if you're closer to this, uh, adding executors is not going to help you at all. Now, the logic why it works is, 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 is follows. Uh, let's say, you know, I give adding more executors will not change the time that I spend uh, in the driver. So hopefully, you know, if, if I add more executors, driver will probably have more work, but it cannot have less amount of work. So adding executors doesn't really changes the time spent in the driver, and that is why that is the path that is part of it. The second part is, uh, unless you change uh, the distribution of the tasks, the largest task uh, of a stage doesn't really, you know, gains anything or cannot be made smaller if you add more executors. So adding more executors only help if you have more tasks uh, than the number of cores. So, so that those tasks can also be done in parallel than having to wait and come for the chance and then run again. So essentially, uh, uh, using this, we can uh, we basically say that you know Spark application will never, you know, cannot run faster uh, than the critical path. Now, what have we learned uh, so far? So what we have learned so far is that a Spark application cannot run faster than its critical path, and that is no matter how many executors. And the way to make a Spark application sort of efficient is by looking at three uh, sort of uh, areas. One is reduce uh, driver-side computation. Uh, second, uh, have enough tasks for uh, all the cores, and then reduce the task queue. And if you cannot do any of them, uh, you might be sort of, you know, the one way to sort of reduce the wastage is by reducing the number of executors. So if you reduce the number of executors, there's, there's sort of a lot more packing of tasks and you'll probably get, uh, you know, much more bang for the buck. So uh, that sort of concludes, uh, you know, my you know, work on uh, the theory behind the Sparklets. Uh, in next uh, few slides, I'll, I'll sort of, you know, talk about Sparklets and how it can be used. So what is Sparklens? So Sparklens is an open source uh, Spark profiling tool and it's written in Scala, it's open source and it can be used with any Spark application. Uh, what I mean by any essentially is that if you're using Cloudera or Hortonworks or EMR, it doesn't matter, or even if you're developing your application on your laptop, uh, you can just, uh, you can use Sparklens and understand uh, how your application is performing. And it basically helps you tune your applications uh, by making it easy to spot opportunities for optimization. And these op uh, opportunities essentially are the one that we discussed, driver-side computations, lack of parallelism, and skew. Uh, apart from being uh, just a profiler, it also has some uh, prediction ca capabilities. It has a built-in uh, 
scheduler simulator, which basically you know can let you simulate uh, if you were to increase the number of cores or decrease the number of cores, how will your application runtime change, or how will your cluster utilization change uh, with those? And it's pretty good because you know uh, instead of trying to experiment with it, so if let's say if your job takes one hour or two hours to run and you're running hundred executors, uh, it it will be very hard for you to sort of you know do experiments by running it on five hundred nodes and twenty nodes. It just takes time and money. So being able to sort of predict it, uh, you know, during using one app, one run of the application is typically fairly useful. All right. So uh, so the example that I'm going to give you this happened like uh, last year sometime, and uh, there was a customer POC, and we we got a 603 lines of Scala code, and you know somebody said this is sort of taking a lot of time. Can you optimize it? And uh, and I think the point to note is that we didn't knew anything about this code. We didn't knew anything about uh, what the schema was or what the person was doing. So it was just like, there's too much context in, in, in that code for us to understand uh, all, all the details of that code. So what, what we'll do here is that we'll walk through this, this uh, how the tuning really happened and see you know, uh, how can we actually tune without really knowing too much about the application. So this is uh, the first pass. So we run SparkLens on this application, and this is uh, what SparkLens reports. Reports. So first one is, uh, you know, it takes uh, 158 minutes to run this application. Uh, 41 minutes are spent on the driver, and 117 minutes are being spent uh, on the executor side. Now we also uh, show the critical path, which is 127 minutes here. And what it tells me is that if uh, I add more executors. Uh, the the performance or the latency will go down because critical path is we have we are not really close to the critical path yet. Uh, the the last para, uh, thing that it reports is the ideal application. Uh, so ideal application is sort of defined as let's say if there was no skew and there were all tasks were uniform uh, and there were enough tasks for every executor, how much time uh, will the application take? So essentially, we are saying if all our application is, is the best possible application in the world, and it, it, it sort of scales linearly uh, on the executor side, how much time will it take? So, uh, so that number is 43 minutes. So what it tells, uh, what it tells us is that uh, there is queue, or at least lack of tasks, which is causing this application to be slow. And we should sort of figure it out and uh, change, uh, you know, make changes appropriately. So, so we started looking at uh, at this uh, the results, and one of the things that we found was that this application had too many stages, like almost uh, 700 stages. And uh, so, typically, you know, when we profile applications, I have seen that 30, 40, 50 is is a usual number. 700 is a very large number. So, one thought that came to mind was there could be you know some sort of a loop going on, which is uh, where this uh, time is being spent. So, we started sort of looking at the code, and we found that uh, there was a uh, there was a there was a write happening to a hive table, and instead of uh, the instead of writing in a parallel manner, the code was basically you know filtering by each partition and doing a write uh, one partition at a time. And uh, so we just thought this, this is probably wrong, and Spark is sort of designed to write, uh, you know, parallelly to all partitions. Why are we sort of, why is this code doing this? So we changed that a couple of lines of code uh, so that a normal Spark uh, write will work and it will write uh, to all the partitions in a parallel manner. Now, what we saw, you know, in the second pause was that uh, instead of 158 minutes, the application took only 26 minutes. And so that was a good improvement. Uh, and uh, also, the driver uh, time came down pretty drastically uh, from 40 minutes to about two minutes, and uh, total, you know, time was uh, just 26 minutes. So, from 158 minutes, we came down to 26 minutes. So, but what what is interesting to note is that uh, the critical path time uh, is is just 25 minutes, which means that if I were to add more executors at this point of time, uh, I really cannot really expect this application to perform any better than 26 minutes. But if I look at the ideal application, which is about five minutes, uh, which is showing four minutes and 48 seconds, uh, there is still scope for improvement. Uh, there is some skew. There is probably some lack of tasks which uh, which we need to look at. And if we if we can uh, sort of fix those things, uh, instead of uh, spending 25 minutes, we could probably bring it down to five minutes or 10 minutes, uh, some some lower number. So uh, this is. Uh, 
So before we sort of debug this further, uh, this further right, uh, one, one thing that we noticed was that the executor, so we, Sparklens also reports you how, how much is the wastage happening on the driver side uh, versus how much is the wastage happening on the executor side. So here we can see that 91% uh, of the total executor time is actually wasted uh, and we don't know why but, but there's huge wastage there and so we should probably look at uh, this wastage and try to minimize it. So uh, as, I, as I told you earlier, Sparklens also has a simulation component where it simulates the results for you. And uh, here, uh, the yellow part, which you see 100 executors and 26 minutes is, is the real uh, number. All the rest of the things that you see are simulated. And uh, you can easily see that you know whenever adding any executors, we go from 100 to 200 to 500, the, the time for computation, at least in the simulation, doesn't go uh, below the 20, uh, 25 minutes. And similarly, we, if we go up and start reducing the number of executors, we see that you know, even if we reduce the number of executors to 50, uh, the total time will, will still be 28 minutes, which is just two minutes more than the current time. So, so you get a nice trade-off between how much compute you want to use versus how much latency you know, is, is useful to, uh, which you want to sort of tolerate. And on the other side, you also have a utilization metric, which tells you how much of the cluster is actually getting used. So if you look at here, uh, we are only using 8% of the cluster with 100 uh, executors, and uh, probably we should target for a lot more. Now, uh, one sort of uh, caution here, when I say utilization, I, I don't mean uh, CPU utilization per se. All I mean is that there was a task which was scheduled on that that, that particular uh, core or that particular machine. Uh, that's all. So it, it's possible that uh, that the machine or the task which you're scheduling is actually I/O bound. It's not CPU bound. So CPU utilization is not uh, you know correlated with the, with the utilization per se. It only means uh, something being scheduled. That's all. So uh, there are sort of a lot of other metrics that, that uh, Sparklens provides, not the top level metrics that we talked about, which is the driver and uh, executive utilization. It also provides metrics per stage. So the metric that we need to look at is for every stage, for example, we have wall clock uh, percentage, uh, core compute hours, task count, P ratio. I'll explain all these numbers, but what, uh, what, uh, what is uh, important to notice here is that if you, if you, for example, look at stage 33, 85% of the time is being spent uh, in this particular stage. So instead of sort of approaching this problem, uh, instead of looking at all the stages, uh, we can very easily narrow down to the few stages where most of the time is being spent, and then try to focus on you know, what's going wrong uh, in these stages. So, so in this case, for example, we see that the number of tasks which are running in this stage is only 10, whereas the number of cores that we have uh, is 800. So, which is, uh, you know, it's a huge wastage. And if we could somehow figure out uh, why this is 10, why there are these 10, 10 tasks only, we can probably, you know, bring it down, uh, increase our utilization. So, uh, in terms of metrics, the, the key metrics that, that are printed are uh, the wall clock percentage, which is the total time spent in the stage uh, relative to the time spent in all the stages. So, which it basically helps you narrow down to few stages where you want to investigate instead of looking at everything. Uh, the P ratio is essentially talks about the parallelism. Ideally, this is, this is basically the number of stages, uh, number of tasks divided by the total number of cores that a stage has. So, typically, you want it to be one or two, something like that. So, instead of you know, if it is lower than one, that is a sort of a that should ring a bell that you're not using the, all the all the cores. Uh, task skew again tells you you know uh, what is the ratio between the largest task and uh, versus uh, a median task, and that gives you a sense of how much uh, you know skew is there in the data, and should is it enough for you to sort of you know go back and start investigating what to do with it. Uh, OI ratio, for example, is is a output bytes to the input bytes at at each stage. And this lets you know, uh, typically you will uh, sort of uh, expect that as you move from one stage to another, uh, slowly the, the amount of data that is uh, reachable to the next stage should, should actually reduce. So if it is not happening, then you should probably you know, look at, uh, maybe there's something wrong with the logic and you should look at it. So uh, sort of coming back to you know, the, uh, where we started, right, the spa, during, the, during the job, what we found is that 85% of the time is spent in a single, single stage, and it has very low number of tasks. So when we looked uh, into the code, we found that repartition 10 was called somewhere in the code, and that is what was causing 
uh, resulting in 10 tasks. Uh, most likely it was done, you know, maybe some other, sometime uh, on a staging environment or something, and the same code sort of uh, came to production. So, so we changed it, uh, and uh, we also uh, changed the Spark SQL shuffle partitions, as I mentioned earlier, uh, from default 200 to 800. So when we ran it, uh, after these changes, uh, we see that the, this application sort of finished in about 10 minutes. So we started with 158 minutes, made a couple of changes, uh, and uh, we could bring this application down to about, about 10 minutes. Interesting to note two things. The critical path at this time is about seven minutes, and ideal application is also about seven minutes. So what it is telling us is that, uh, you know, adding more executors is not gonna help. Uh, we are sort of, you know, performing in a way where there is uh, hardly any skew, and uh, we, Basically, this is this is sort of a definition of a highly optimized. How does a good application looks like? So, if, if your critical path and application path uh, are same, then you have achieved uh, you know nirvana essentially in the Spark world. Even if you you know you don't have to be pretty exact, but uh, this is where you where you know your application is truly scalable. So, uh, with that, I, I just wanted to sort of you know. Uh, come to limitations also. Uh, so, so essentially, if you look at it, Spark Lens is a model uh, which is built using looking at uh, a run of a job, and it predicts the behavior of the same job when uh, when you run it on different sort of uh, different uh, number of cores. But uh, still, it's a model, and there are of course there are second order effects which we don't take care of. So, a few of those things are, for example, uh, executor or driver GC. So, if GC is happening either before or after, you know, in a, in, a, uh, in in some uh, some executor, for example, when you're running your job, it's possible that that overpowers, uh, you know, uh, con sort of configures the model uh, incorrectly. And if you run it, uh, you know, in 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 some uh, if it's, when you run it uh, with different set of codes, the behavior that you see is a little different. Then uh, shuffle service uh, performance uh, varies with the size of the cluster. A 10 node cluster will have a different uh, characteristic than a 100 node cluster. So uh, that will come up, will, can be a, bo a bottleneck or a limiting factor. Again, uh, when working with S3, the throttling, uh, network bandwidth, CPU contention, there are a lot of other factors uh, beyond just the availability of tasks which can uh, limit uh, the scalability of your application. So uh, those still, uh, have role to play, but in general, if you're not, you know, going from 10 to 10,000 uh, in, 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 in a reasonable range, uh, you will find that uh, the numbers are uh, what the Sparklens predicts are, are pretty useful. And also, uh, one good part is that when you run Sparklens, it will also report its own error, saying, you know, uh, this is the actual time and this is what I predicted it should be. So if if that number looks to be fairly large, uh, you have to take the results with a pinch of salt. And uh, that's, uh, yeah, one more thing is, uh, if you're using, for example, large executors, lar by large executor mean you're using executors which are larger than uh, when you ran the Spark Lens, uh, the plan itself can change in the sense that uh, broadcast joins become accessible, so Spark might change the plan to use broadcast joins, in which case the structure is not quite comparable, so the performance that uh, Spark Lens predict will probably not be same. Uh, and uh, the last one is uh, the Spark default parallelism. Since this number actually depends on, on the actual number of cores, if uh, your application is using this number, then this number will change uh, as you move to more number of tasks, and hence the prediction will, will also change. So these are some of the reasons why, you know, where things, uh, you know, uh, the output of the spark lens could be wrong. Uh, but that's fine. I, I generally don't think of output of spark lens in terms of right and wrong. Mostly in terms of is it useful? Does it help you? Guide you? Are you doing trial and errors? Or do you have you know some sort of uh, idea or some sort of direction? What is more important? What to look at? What to focus on? And what is uh, what? Uh, how you, you can sort of you know navigate your way around uh, tuning uh, your Spark application? And uh, in summary, uh, Spark application cannot run faster than its critical path. Uh, Spark application can be made efficient by reducing driver side computation, having enough tasks uh, for the course, and reducing task queue. And if completion time is not an issue, by reducing the number of uh, executors. So uh, this is open source, and uh, there's only two. So when you run your Spark submit, if you add these two parameters, uh, hyphen hyphen packages, and uh, on Spark extra listeners, uh, you could see as when the job completes, you will see all this output that comes from Spark Lens, and it's open source, so the code is available. If you guys want to try out, contribute, change, everything is there. That's all. Uh, thank you. We have time for questions. Hello. 
Hello. Hello. Yeah. So this is useful for a normal Spark application, but how do we do it for stream applications? Oh, so there is a. I think someone from Intuit asked for it, and they are working on a PR for this. So hopefully there will be something. Okay. Not right now. Uh, one way to do that is to, for example, uh, you can uh, you can sort of manually sort of stop the application after one run and see what kind of behavior do you see. So if even, even if we stop the application, it should be able to produce the results. It should be able to produce how, gi given the nature of, assuming that the application characteristics or the data characteristics are not changing, the prediction that you get uh, based on how many extra cores do you add, uh, it, it should be a useful information to have even with one prediction, sort of one data source, one data batch thing. Those who are leaving the auditorium, please make sure that you drop your feedback forms uh, at the help desk. There is a there is a box specially kept for feedback forms. Please drop your feedback forms there. Hi. Uh, Hi. Can you please share uh, some of the best practices uh, to optimize a Spark app which does I/O? So I have, to I have to connect to a REST API. So there are limited number of uh, outgoing connections. I mean, there are limited number of connections in a connector pool. So can you sh share some of the best practices to reduce the skew uh, in those scenarios? So if you're connecting to uh, using REST API and talking to a REST API, so if you look at S3, it's a REST API. So it's not that there is any problem uh, connecting to REST API. The problem essentially is, are you d doing it from the driver or the executors? So executors are scalable, and if your service is scalable, technically you should be able to uh, scale it to the point that you want to. So if the limitation is not on the Spark side, as long as the uh, your REST API is be being called from the executor side, it is the limitation of the API itself, essentially. Hello. Hi. Hi. So, how do you calculate the critical path number and ideal application path number? Sure. So, critical path number uh, is essentially the time spent in the driver because if you add more executors, your driver will not magically run faster. So, that time is not going to change. The second thing we add to it is for every stage, uh, what is the largest task? So if you had look at uh, the largest task, that task is not going to run faster if there are more executors. So that is some of the large, so essentially there's some little bit more caveat there in the sense that some stages run in parallel. So you have to be sort of, actually know the DAG and compute it that way, but uh, that's, that's what it is. Ideal application is essentially look at uh, uh, all the time that is spent in all, all the tasks in a stage and divide it by the total number of executors. So what you get is a uh, uniform number, average number, and ideally if average is what happens, that is what you want. Every executor gets uh, enough tasks and they run all the time. Hi. Hi. Uh, in the Spark job, it also happens that sometimes the speed of the Spark job also depends on the size of the file. Right. If there are too many small files or if there are very big files, so based on uh, each Spark executor, uh, does... Uh, uh, your Spark Lens also tells that your files are too small, make it more bigger files so that there will be less uh, disk I.O. or something like that? So uh, it depends on if the, if, the, the, if the format of the file is splittable or not. If the format of the file is splittable, then in that case, even if it's a big file, it's not that one Spark executor is going to run through all, will, will work on full file. And uh, second part is, yes, uh, if you're spending a lot of time in one of the tasks, in one of the executors, and there is a skew, that will get, it's not, it'll not report it at a file level, but it'll report that there's some tasks which are very, very large. Hopefully, if you know the stage, and if you look at the code, you will understand that uh, this is, you know, this, this stage is actually about file I.O. And so that correlation you have to make. But uh, for Sparklens, it's just the tasks and the durations that it looks at. 